Welcome to the Real Life Show Living with a Chronic Illness. We are your hosts, Cassie and Chelsea. I'm Cassie, a single mom living with a chronic illness who is extremely passionate about living a full and happy life. And I'm Chelsea, a mindset coach that has a passion for helping people learn to put themselves first and be the best version of themselves each and every day. We came together to create Spoonies Unite, an uplifting community that offers resources, guidance, and support so you can live your best life while giving you the space to be yourself, be heard, and feel understood. We hope that by providing education from experts, we help Spoonies and their loved ones thrive. This show is not only for those who live with a chronic illness, but their friends, family, spouses, and just anyone else existing on the earth. Our goal is to normalizing having a chronic illness by sharing the real stories with real people and show the world how relatable those everyday struggles can be. There's a little something in here for everyone. And of course, thank you to our patrons for your continued support making this possible. If you love our show and want to get some extra goodies, go to patreon.com slash the real spoonies unite. Enjoy the show. Welcome to today's episode. Today, we're going to talk all about gut health, the ins and outs of your gut. (laughs) That's funny. Anyways. So gut health is important for everybody, especially those of us living with a chronic illness. But let's face it, gut health is like very commonly known these days um, to be an important part of overall health for everyone. So we are interviewing today Dr. Heather Finley of at gutbrain.nutrition on Instagram. Dr. Heather Finley is a registered dietitian nutritionist specializing in functional and integrative approaches to reduce gastrointestinal symptoms and mood issues by addressing the root cause and addressing nutritional lifestyle and stress-related factors. Heather created her in-person and virtual nutrition practice, Nourish Functional Health, to provide personalized nutrition and wellness solutions using cutting-edge science alongside evidence-based medical nutrition therapy. Heather niched down to gastrointestinal issues due to her own journey with GI issues and anxiety that for years was confusing and frustrating. Heather turned one of her biggest struggles into her passion and has helped hundreds of individuals find relief from gastrointestinal issues and live their lives symptom-free with her integrative and personalized approach. Heather lives in Texas with her husband, Dave, and daughter, Charlotte. We had a wonderful conversation with Dr. Heather Finley talking all about what really impacts your gut because it's not just the food you are putting inside of your body. There are so many other factors like how you are moving your body, how much sleep you're getting, the sleep that you're getting, the stress that you're getting. Um, All those things put together are going to impact your gut. And so she gives some amazing tangible tips on how to help you be the healthiest that you can by taking care of your gut. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's episode of The Real Life Show, Living with a Chronic Illness. Today, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Heather Finley. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Yay. So Cassie and I are so excited to talk to you today. Uh, Cassie, do you want to tell everyone how you discovered Dr. Heather Finley? Yeah, so I have been following her on Instagram at gutbrain.nutrition for over a year, and um, she has the most amazing captions and graphics that really capture um, my kind of belief system in the gut-brain nutrition, Uh, discussing a lot about the connection between the both, stress, um, food, all the things. Um, I haven't really found another account quite like hers out there. And I was just so intrigued and so excited to get to kind of pick your brain and ask questions and get some more info about this whole gut microbiome phenomenon. <laughs> yeah, so, it's quite the thing. It really is. Um, and so would you start with just telling us a little bit about yourself and perhaps your experience with Um, gut issues and what led you down, you know, this path and what got you here today? Sure. So I was one of those kids that always had gut issues and kind of just thought that that was how my life was supposed to be. I went to doctor after doctor and 
really just didn't get any answers. Um, and so just kind of got to a point in high school thinking like, well, I guess this is how I'm supposed to feel all the time. I guess I'm supposed to feel bloated and constipated all the time. And um, I guess I just better get used to my normal. But there was still a part of me that felt like there's got to be something like whether it's nutrition or whether it's something else. And so I went to college and was studying nutrition and kind of made myself my own case study. So just decided like, well, if no one else can help me, maybe I can help myself. And so went through college and learned a lot about nutrition, but still didn't learn a ton about um, how to really help myself. Um, after college, I was working in a hospital, doing clinical nutrition, and still really struggling with gut issues. And I feel like they were almost at their peak. I was working um, a full-time job. I was in grad school and my dad was also really sick with colon cancer. And so I think just the stress of all of that made my issues worse. And so that kind of triggered a light bulb, like, well, maybe there's a connection here with stress. Um, and just started kind of doing my own research, seeing some different types of doctors and different types of practitioners and realized that gut health wasn't as simple as I maybe thought it was. I think I just instantly blamed food for all of my symptoms, but the problem was I could never really figure out what the food problems were. And so um, would restrict certain things from my diet and still didn't have relief and kind of whittled my way down to a very small list of safer foods, but that truly did isolate me and um, made it really hard to be out in public with friends or go to social events. And um, I knew I didn't want to live like that. So um, like I said, started seeing different types of practitioners as well as doing my own research and realized that gut health encompassed not only nutrition, but also stress management, sleep, um, exercise, and really by approaching it from a holistic perspective of looking at all the things that affect the gut, I was actually able to find a lot of relief. Um, and so that's when I ended up going and getting my doctorate and um, really truly learned a ton about um, functional nutrition and how to integrate everything when treating a patient and continue to kind of make myself my own case study um, still and really was able to get to the root of my problems um, and find relief. And it surprised me to realize that, yes, nutrition was so important and that's something that I work with my patients on, but it also is so important to manage stress and sleep and um, not over-exercise and um, get sunshine and have fun. And so it's really just given me a new perspective on health and really what that means um, for me and for for my patients and everyone else so that's a little bit about my journey it was definitely not a short one but i'm grateful for it and now i'm able to help hundreds um, of people find relief from their gut issues using my framework um, which i used on myself so yeah that's incredible Thank you so much for sharing that. I know I have a personal training background, it's kind of where I started um, in my career. And I, I love that you said over-exercise, like a lot of people over-exercise because that's a pattern that I've seen myself. Mm -hmm. um, most people do way more than they actually need to do and it does a lot more harm than good, it cancels out any good benefits that they would have gotten. So I, I love that you kind of brought that in as that's one of the things that's contributing to people not feeling their best, their gut health not being what it could be. So since there's such a holistic approach, you have sleep, you have stress management, you have exercise, you've got the food that you're eating. What is like with this framework, where do you start people at? Like, is it a little bit of everything or is there something that kind of you, you draw them towards maybe sleep or stress or wh where do you start them? It kind of just depends on the patient and what's going on. But, 
you kind of start with a little bit of everything. Honestly, sleep is huge. And so that's something that I stress in the beginning, like trying to get good quality sleep. But oftentimes my patients, because their nutrition is off, they're not sleeping well because either their blood sugar is mismanaged or they're under eating or they're eating in a very restrictive way. Not in the sense of like restricting calories, but restricting tons of different foods. And so their body's just not getting what it needs. And so their sleep is not restful. They're up all night or they're up every couple hours. And so it kind of, we kind of have to start with a lot of things um, and slowly progress from there. But really it's sleep and nutrition, I think in the beginning, as well as just teaching ways to manage stress. So if someone is like, overly stressed about their food or they're mismanaging their stress like I was, um, you know, they could be eating whatever they want, but your body just can't digest and absorb food as well if your brain is overly stressed. So working on stress management, and sometimes that means working with a therapist. I am not a therapist. My master's is in sports psychology, but I'm not a licensed therapist. And so sometimes my patients do benefit from seeing someone to help them learn skills and techniques to manage stress. But definitely working with them on mindful eating, breathing, meditation, and all of that to help them kind of from a holistic approach from the beginning. So I don't know if that answers your question, but you kind of have to start with everything um, mm -hmm. in not an overwhelming way, but just like tweaking little things. And I think sometimes people think it has to be this huge overhaul. I know I've had people on my Instagram and patients say like, I was so scared of getting help for my gut issues because I thought I was going to have to completely change my life. And in a way, yes, you do have to change your life, but I think it's a lot less overwhelming than people realize. Like there are ways to improve your nutrition for your gut health and improve stress that don't have to be overwhelming. Um, Cause if we're creating things that are overwhelming, then that's just adding more stress. So mm -hmm. finding a way to make it doable for people. I think that's awesome. It's when they have gut issues, sometimes the, the problem becomes that they never get off of the elimination diet. So they may go on some elimination diet, eliminate a bunch of foods, but then never add them back in. And that's not the point. The point is to, whether you're doing low FODMAP or something else, the point is to actually add everything back in to figure out what the triggers are, which should be a pretty short list of things. And so... I think that's sometimes where people go wrong, just like, okay, I feel better right now, but typically what I've heard from my patients and what I hear from a lot of people is, well, I felt really good when I did that, but it only lasted a certain amount of time. And that's just because you're not addressing the underlying issue or the other parts of gut health that don't have to do with food. That's really interesting. So if you've got someone that, like I have tons of friends um, that are celiac, Mm -hmm. um, so gluten has a very negative reaction to them. Sure. So yeah. They, that's a separate case. Yeah. So then for that, I mean, how do you recommend someone who has to cut out gluten entirely? How do you recommend that they still continue to get that variety in their diet? Yeah. And I mean, the great news is like in our culture, there's so many options. So yeah, that's a great point. If someone has celiac, obviously they should not be eating gluten. That is not going to be good for them. Mm -hmm. um, but there's so many gluten-free grains that they can enjoy. So they can have rice, they can have quinoa. Um, and we live in a culture where 
you know, unfortunately and fortunately, gluten-free is very trendy. And so there's a lot of options out there, um, which makes it a lot easier. Even 10 years ago, being celiac was significantly harder than it is now. So just trying to find the variety within the confines of what you're able to do. So like, for example, celiac, getting grains in in a gluten-free grains that you can tolerate is better than just saying, well, then I'm not going to have any. Um, it can be very restricting and socially isolating and just not great for the gut anyways, because your gut thrives on fiber. So if you're restricting all gluten-free grains from your gut as well, um, your diversity in your gut, your bacterial diversity is going to suffer too, which could lead to other stuff down the road. So again, like variety is just so important for so many different reasons. So speaking of fiber, I would love to hear your thoughts on when you have um, a gut problem, Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, or perhaps IBS too, maybe diverticulitis, gastroparesis. We are frequently told to limit the fiber. Mm -hmm. low fiber diet. I was put on a low fiber diet after I had a small bowel obstruction and I was, I'm, that happened in May of 2017. Um, it's now April, 2020. And I still am like low fiber. And, um, but then I've like read some really interesting articles lately about saying that people with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis should be eating more fiber and should be eating more vegetables. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, well then which one do you do? And I do find sometimes that eating a salad is not, you know, doesn't always agree with me, but I have to admit that part of that I wonder is like, I'm stressed about it. Like I'm stressed about eating the salad. How is it going to affect me? Is it going to be okay? Cause I love salad and I miss it so much, but there's like a worry. And then I'm like, am I doing this or is it really happening? And so when I read these articles lately, um, talking about eating more vegetables and more fiber, um, that it's good for you. Like I said, whereas we're told like, stay away, that's terrible. I mean, when you get given your Crohn's diagnosis or ulcerative colitis diagnosis, and you get given the pamphlet from the foundation mm -hmm. of what you should and shouldn't eat, it's like, you know, soft white breads like donuts are good, you know, and pizza because the red sauce on the pizza has tomatoes and vitamin A in it and stay away from, you know, dark leafy greens. And it's like, what? <laughs> and it's like crazy to be told to eat this way. And when I first was given that pamphlet, I was on AIP. And so I was like, these people are crazy. They don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> and then it was like a year and a half later that I was living on baby rice cereal and bone broth for like two months. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear your thoughts and experiences, perhaps working with people about, um, with gut diagnoses and, uh, yeah, like fiber, low fiber, lots of fiber. Yeah, that's a great question. And it is pretty controversial depending on where you look, who you talk to, what research you read, but the research is changing and it's important to, to note that, but there's so much research right now on prebiotic fiber and the benefits not only to the gut, but also to the brain for mood and for just inflammation in the body in general. But you have to be careful. I mean, and that's where I would say personalized nutrition, like what works for patient A is not going to work for patient B. And so if you're struggling, I would encourage you to reach out to someone who can help you because, you know, some of my patients can totally tolerate salad, no problem. Other patients, we have to do more pureed vegetables or soft cooked vegetables, but they can still do them. And so it's just figuring out the form in which you can tolerate it and then also figuring out your limits too like maybe you can tolerate this much but you can't this much or also figuring out why you can't which for most people it's because of their diagnosis but I, like even going further than that like why can't i tolerate it um or how can like how can i cook it differently to be able to tolerate it what amounts can i tolerate and how can i slowly very 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 slowly build up my tolerance to these things because we know that fiber is so important and 
Um, you know, I hear that from patients a lot. Like I miss eating salad or I miss eating vegetables or I miss eating, you know, X, Y, and Z recipe that I used to make. And so, yeah, um, working with someone who can help you and, and making it specific to you, that's where I think it can be really problematic just Googling you know, diet for Crohn's and you're going to see so many different opinions and Dr. Google like articles about what worked for so-and-so or what didn't work for so-and-so. And you can easily get trapped in kind of this vortex of mm -hmm. opinions and it can be stressful. And that's where I think then it can also create a lot of food fear. So while well, I read that this vegetable didn't work for so-and-so from this blog, so it's probably not going to work for me, but I'm going to try it. And then, like you said, like maybe you're stressed about it. So it can kind of become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Am I having a symptom because I'm stressed about it? Or am I having a symptom because I'm actually having a symptom? Um, and it could be either or. But I do think it's important for people to stay off Google and to really figure out who am I getting my information from? Because anyone can create a blog talking about their own experience and so really figuring out like how do I get trusted accurate information and also knowing like I probably need to talk to someone to figure out what works for me. Well what would you recommend to someone who is looking to get a little extra help what should they look for in certain individuals? If they're looking for help specific to food then I would say consult a registered dietitian because they are the only nutrition professionals that are actually regulated and licensed. There's a lot of people that are self-proclaimed nutritionists or um, nutrition therapists, but that doesn't actually mean anything. And so there's a lot of people out there claiming to be nutrition experts that don't actually have degrees in this. And so they're giving information based off personal experience and that can be really dangerous. So start with a registered dietitian, look up their experience, make sure that it's someone who is an expert in GI or an expert in whatever you're struggling with and talk to them before you go, you know, to so-and-so's blog, who's a nutrition therapist or a nutritionist, I guess you could say. So another question I have is um, going into, it's becoming more common that everyone says like all healing starts with the gut, mm -hmm. you know, start with the gut and then everything will follow, you know, in a way. And I have definitely been sitting here like, well, what if the gut is your problem? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I have just like wanted to just talk to someone in like a curiosity way of like, if I, I would love for you to talk about the connection of if you have like hypothyroidism or um, Hashimoto's or endometriosis or all these other um, diseases or syndromes that <clears throat> are related to your gut health and starting healing with the gut. And so how you could maybe discuss um, the connections of those and why it's so important to start with the gut and yeah. then follow that with like, if your issue is the gut, what are your thoughts about that too? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of new research coming out just about how the gut really is kind of the center of it all. And the reason is because 70%, I mean, it depends who you talk to, but about 70% of your immune system is in your gut. So when you're looking at any autoimmune condition, um, that is gut related. So if you think about it, your gut is where you digest and absorb your nutrients from your food. So if your gut is damaged, that's obviously going to affect how you're digesting and absorbing nutrition from your food. Um, which could have long-term consequences, but then kind of going to the gut-brain axis, what your gut says, your brain says, and vice versa, they're in constant communication with each other. And, um, you know, your serotonin, which is a, a neurotransmitter for mood that's produced in the gut, um, as well as the way that you rid yourself of hormone, like estrogen, is through your stool. And so, um, if you're digesting and absorbing your food correctly and you're going to the bathroom regularly and like clearing your intestines, it has 
super beneficial effects on not only um, hormones, but also neurotransmitters that are important for mood, um, you know, and anything really related to the body's ability to detox. So I don't know if that makes sense, but that kind of is a broad overview just in how um, the gut really is connected to everything because of the immune system and because of digestion and absorption and because of neurotransmitter production in the gut. So what is it exactly that causes that damage? So like as someone who doesn't have a chronic illness, I would like to continue my life not having an illness and having a healthy gut and feeling my best. So what are some things that can cause damage or that people should be aware of that these habits are not so good? And then how do you also know if you have damage in your gut? Because if you start maybe noticing some underlying effects, it'd be better to probably fix those sooner rather than later before they get bigger and bigger and they manifest into this really big problem. Yeah. So you can kind of think of it like a campfire, right? So like if you've ever been to a campfire, like after everyone goes to bed, like the fire's just kind of smoldering. So we can kind of think of it like what are the big logs that we put in that then bring the fire back to life? So you know, really anything affects the gut, but stress, like we've talked about, nutrition, um, exercise, like either under or over exercise, smoking, um, environment, pollutants, um, medications. I mean, really, like you can think of any anything that you would think like impacts your health, obviously impacts your gut. Um, so like if you're looking to keep your gut healthy, like the most broad overview or the most general advice I can give is manage your stress, get enough sleep, drink plenty of water, eat a variety of foods, eat fiber, you know, pending you can tolerate it, or if not, like work with someone to help you. Um, and that will get you worlds ahead of probably where most people are um, and help to just maintain a healthy gut. I don't think it has to be anything like overwhelmingly stressful or overwhelmingly um, something that's overwhelming and not doable. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, all these fancy powders or pills or detoxes or whatever. Um, if anything, like I would say, stay away from a lot of those things because, you know, there's not one food that's going to keep your gut healthy and there's not one food or supplement that's going to like totally overhaul your gut. It's a combination of everything that you do that really maintains gut health. And then what are some like, if, if for me, what are some signs I should be aware of or anyone listening if they're, that's a kind of a symptom of you might have some gut issues starting? Yeah, gut issues can look like anything. So they can look like, obviously, digestive issues. They could look like constipation or diarrhea, stomach cramping. But gut issues could also look like migraines. They could look like hormone imbalance. They could look like, um, you know, mood issues. They could look like sleep issues. So I would say that, like, if you have this, like, chronic issue that is disturbing your life, um, maybe figure out like, okay, what's the root of that problem? You know, if, and it could be related to the gut. And, um, we've kind of talked about the over-exercising a little bit. Um, I'd like to talk about that a little bit more too. Um, because I definitely experienced that myself, especially when my Crohn's was in a flare and I was teaching bar classes and when teaching bar, you're often doing the class and, I found that it was too much cardio for me because I would leave every class and like my joints were puffy, my stomach was distended. And so I have to be really careful still like how much cardio I do. And then I've worked with a lot of clients um, who that's been a similar thing for them. Um, I had a client who was diagnosed with POTS and um, it seems like there might be something else going on too. And she loved working out like super hardcore CrossFit body pump and cannot do that anymore. A lot of water retention. Um, so can you discuss that a little bit further about why over-exercising can aggravate perhaps your symptoms? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think something that's often missed. So obviously we know that exercise is really good for health. It's good for mood. It's good for a lot of things. It's good for joint health to an extent, but sometimes too much of a good thing can be 
a bad thing. And so if you kind of think of it just like the fire that I described, if you're just adding more fire to the if to the the ashes, um, it's going to make it worse. So like especially when someone's already struggling with high levels of inflammation from a gut issue, if you're over exercising to the point where then you're just adding more inflammation, um, it's obviously not going to turn out good. Um, if your body's not able to recover because it's also working on trying to heal your gut issue and then it's trying to heal from this excessive exercise, that's not going to be helpful. So oftentimes people will find that decreasing cardio and focusing more on yoga or Pilates or slower, more strengthening exercises can be good. Um, I am not a pelvic floor expert and don't claim to be one, but I do know that there's also a component of, like especially with running, um, the pelvic floor component of how that affects the digestive tract. Um, I have a friend who's a pelvic floor PT, and I know that that's something that she sees a lot. It's just gut issues because of like the integrity and strength of the pelvic floor. But that's obviously getting into something completely different. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that overexercise can impact um, the gut, mostly just from added stress, but also just the extra adrenaline. You know, if you're over exercising your body is gonna be secreting more cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and cortisol we know negatively affects the gut. Um, so trying to keep cortisol levels low so that your body can heal and reduce inflammation. Thank you so much for sharing that. I know um, I've been preaching don't exercise as much as the media and the fitness and health industry has made you believe that you have to. Um, I've been preaching that for years and I just, it makes me feel so happy when other health professionals say the same thing. I'm like, yes, <laughs> but enough of us say it. People will actually listen. Um, you don't have to kill yourself for every single workout. It actually does so much more harm than good. So yeah. And I mean, that's a great point. Like you don't have to kill yourself. I was talking to a client yesterday about this and she um, was a competitive athlete and has gut issues. And we had to talk about how like it's okay to exercise and not feel completely exhausted afterwards and that it's actually a good thing. And, you know, for years and years and years, she's been taught that like, if you're not dead after practice, then you didn't work hard enough. And mm -hmm. So retraining her brain to view exercise as a relaxing and health promoting thing is very different than what she was trained to believe about being exhausted. You know, she kind of had this mindset of like, if I don't go to bed completely exhausted every night and sore the next morning, then I did something wrong. And so, yep. yeah, it's hard. I think it's kind of normal to feel like that's necessary just because of the way that our society views exercise and views health. I mean, really having to retrain yourself. If you are one of those people who likes to work out like that and get sore and get the heart rate up, you almost have to retrain your thinking that it's okay, you know, to not feel like that. I mean, there's yeah. a huge acceptance factor with that. Um, Cause I, I, I love hiking. Um, and when I lived in Montana, like oh, the culture was hiking and skiing and outdoors. Um, but I found that I felt like shit every time that we went and did that stuff and more of like a leisurely, leisurely walk, you know, through the mountains and enjoying, um, the scenery and the fresh air was made me feel invigorated and good. Whereas mm -hmm. going for like a hike and trying to get to the top, it would set me back for a week. Yeah. And, um, there was like a huge mental and emotional battle of like, am I really out of shape? Should I just push through, you know, push through, push through, keep going, keep going. But then it was like, but I don't feel good. Something's wrong. And I specifically rem remember being on like the side of a mountain with my ex-husband and I literally was going up and I was like, I think I'm going to die on this mountain. All I want to do is just sleep on this rock. Like it was just the weirdest feeling. And this was before my diagnosis actually, but I was just like, something is, I knew something was wrong. It took a long time to get diagnosed, of course, you know, with like mm -hmm. the autoimmune world, but 
it was a very weird moment of like, I just want to be asleep, you know, mm-hmm. on these rocks. I'm going to die. I cannot keep going. And my body was like shutting down. And so do you have any like tips for people who maybe are realizing that they can't do the workouts that they used to, or especially with outdoor physical activity, maybe you loved riding your bike a ton and you know, you can't maybe you have that isn't accessible to you right now. Mm -hmm. Um, Do you have tips of how to work through those emotions to accept the new exercise that's most beneficial for you now? Yeah. And I think that it's going to be different for, um, everybody. So figuring out a way to move your body and that feels good, but isn't causing more harm. I do think that movement can be a helpful thing, but knowing that like right now it might just have to be slower or less cardio based or less intense than you're used to in order to manage your symptoms. And so whether that is like walking or whether that is, I mean, I I would say that I don't think that you have to completely give up everything you love, but maybe modify the intensity to which you do it. So if you really do love running and it's, it's helpful and enjoyable for you, maybe you just cut down on the miles that you run, cut down on the speed at which you run the amount of times per week and fill in the other time with other things whether that's other movement or just other hobbies um, and just finding other outlets. Cause I think for a lot of people, exercise is their only outlet for stress management, but you have to have multiple outlets. I know for me, when I was mismanaging my stress, running was really the only thing that gave me relief. And I had to learn that that wasn't healthy and that I needed to find other ways to manage my stress. And Um, other things to do, whether that's yoga or whether that is painting, you know, it it can look different for every person, but it's, it's important to have multiple ways to manage stress and to um, move versus just cardio or just like high intensity exercise. Which is great about you saying like having multiple ways to manage your stress because Um, when you were talking about your experience and your story and you said that you realized you were doing kind of like stress mismanagement, I'm sure there's a lot of us that have to be walking around out there thinking that we're like doing a great job managing our stress and Mm -hmm. maybe you're not. Yeah. And I think it goes back to culture, right? Like, oh, she's so disciplined. She runs every day, you know, and it's like, you're kind of praised for that, but, and, and it can be hard to like, if your identity is in running or it's in something, it can be hard to give that up, but it can also be very empowering to realize like I, I can manage my stress other ways and um, I don't have to be known for this one thing, like trying to find identity in other places. Um, But I know that that's extremely hard and that usually involves working with people to help you through that. And that's okay too. Like it's okay to reach out for help and recognize like, I can't do this by myself. Mm -hmm. I think you, you bring up a great point of our society kind of celebrates a lot of those qualities that do lead to stress mismanagement, high stress. Like we, we, put people that are incredibly disciplined and hard workers and are always just kind of pushing through their challenges. We kind of put them on a pedestal sometimes, Mm -hmm. even though like when you kind of look at it, it's, they're, they're not living their healthiest life. And so I think that that's really interesting. And question I have for you is I'm one of these people, um, that sometimes struggles with doing a little bit too much, um, loading my plate up. And when it comes to eating, I am definitely a fast eater (laughs) and um, I tend to do eating on the go a lot. Um, Not right now since I'm pretty much staying home with everything going on out in the world, but a lot of times it's, it's really common for me to eat breakfast in my car as I drive to work or drive to wherever I'm going Um, or I eat lunch while I'm still kind of working on something. Um, And even like when I eat dinner, I feel like I'm, my goal is just to like, eat everything almost as fast as I can because I'm really, really hungry. <laughs> I'm mm-hmm. like, let me just eat all the food. And you've mentioned that eating should take around 20 minutes per meal. Can you kind of talk about why that's so important? And then some strategies for people like me who tend to eat a little bit faster, what we can do to get that to slow down. Yeah. And that's a great 
question and that's a great point because it shows that there are other ways to manage digestive issues besides food. I think getting people to be intentional about their food and, and teaching people to be mindful with their food really does improve digestion because it does slow them down and it does make them more aware of fullness um, and hunger levels. And so um, one thing that I like to have my clients do is practice just taking four box breaths before eating. So a box breath is breathing in for four, holding for four, breathe out for four, and holding for four. And doing that four times through before eating to help relax the digestive tract. Because if you're stressed while you're eating, your body is not able to digest your food as well. Your digestive enzymes aren't as readily available. And so that will lead to you feeling overly full or overly bloated or constipated or whatever it is. Um, and so if you can just slow your yourself down before you even take a bite, it really can make a difference. The other thing too is whether you're eating with someone or not, um, you know, if you're, if you're eating with a spouse or family member or friend, trying to pace yourself with them if they're a slower eater can be helpful. Um, but obviously you don't want to do that in a comparison way, just like trying to like have a conversation, trying to chew your food, set your fork down so that you're, you know, chewing all the way, swallowing, you know, saying something to the person that you're with, um, and then taking another bite. So really trying to mechanically digest your food by chewing before you actually swallow can make a big difference. Um, and then trying to do the box breaths after can help with digestion as well. Um, I really encourage my clients to not try to work or do anything while they're eating. Now, I'm not perfect at this either. I worked while I was eating lunch yesterday. Like I'm not the, I'm not going to try and sit here and pretend like I do it perfectly all the time. Cause I don't, and no one does, but, um, as much as you can trying to eat and just eat. So eating on a plate at the table with no distractions. So no phone, no TV, obviously eating with people I think is helpful, but that should be the only distraction is someone else. Um, and that can really make a difference. Uh, one exercise that might be helpful is pretending like you're a news critic. So pretend you work for Food and Wine magazine and you're going to write an article about the meal that you're having. So that will slow you down too. Like, what does this taste like? What's the texture? What does the room look like? What's the smell? And there's a lot of things you can even write down before you ever even take a bite. Um, you know, what's, what is the smell? What do I anticipate this is going to taste like? What does it look like? Um, who am I sitting with? Is there music on? Um, and so that can bring your awareness too. So trying to engage all of your senses, I think is helpful. And so that might be something to slow you down also. But, you know, if you struggle with eating on the go, I think a lot of people do. That's pretty normal. Um, just really prioritizing food in a way, just like you would an appointment. So I have an appointment with myself at this time to eat lunch, and I'm not going to let anything get in the way of that. Um, and then just giving yourself grace when you can't. If you are in a rush and you have to eat your breakfast on the way to work, then try your best to create a mindful experience as much as you can, um, as safely as you can while driving, but um, just giving yourself grace and knowing that like, I'm not always gonna be able to have like 20 minutes to eat, but I'm gonna try to as much as I can. Those are some great tips and I'm totally gonna try them tonight because my fiance eats way slower than I do. <laughs> and I've always kind of been like, why aren't you eating faster? Like, come on, like eat your food. It's yummy. I think it's my thing. It's like, it tastes good. I want to eat it faster, which doesn't really make sense because if I eat slower, it would last longer and I'd enjoy the taste for longer. Uh, <laughs> but I'm definitely going to try those tonight and kind of see what differences I feel. Yeah. 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 And I think, um, you know, it can be good, like, if someone that you're eating with is willing to, like, talking about it, like, oh, mm -hmm. I really like this or, you know, what do you enjoy about this? I actually had a patient the other day do this and she had made some recipe that she always made. And she's like, I actually figured out that I really don't like this. Like I've just been eating this like so routinely for so long and just, but like was so unaware of my food that like, I just would eat it. And then she's like, 
I actually really don't enjoy it that much. And so, you know, that was like very profound for her to recognize. Like, yeah, I actually don't love this recipe. I've just been like making it because I'm used to, and you know, she probably will continue to make the recipe because it's an easy thing, but maybe try to like change it up to see how she enjoys it better. Yeah. That's really interesting. I, I started eating slower because I just naturally found that I felt better if I did. Um, but my mom being European and such, she, she definitely taught me like from childhood growing up and she's like, you know, this, this croissant is the best croissant that you're ever going to taste. You know, look at how delicious it is. Like, look at how flaky it is. And then you take a bite and doesn't it just melt in your mouth and really taught us to like, enjoy the food that was put in front of us. And she's like, you know, food is such a big part of life and it's wonderful and you should enjoy it and, you know, savor it. And I kind of grew up with that thinking, you know, eating slow, savoring it, talking about it, looking at it, you know, she would make a plate and throw certain things on it just to make more colors on the plate, to make it look more appetizing. How does that affect the taste because the colors really, those tomatoes really bring out the spinach, you know, and the feta and everything. And um, coming from that, there was like a huge amount of grief, I think, that I went through when going into some of those restrictions and not being able to eat, um, you know, foods, a lot of stuff anymore. And um, it was devastating for a long time. But everything you're saying and with like the variety, I think there's, there's could be another mindset shift of like not looking at all the things that you've taken out or that you can't have, but enjoying the things that you can have. And even for that client of yours to be like, I actually don't really like this. That's kind of interesting. I mean, I'm going to have to look at like a lot of my meals and be like, do I even really enjoy this? Does it make me feel good? Um, I'm sure there's like, that's probably something a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. Just like eating kind of on autopilot. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think it's like, you know, food is obviously kind of like, you know, we were saying about like how your mom would cook with like different colors, but like food is obviously for nutrition and for nourishing our bodies, but it's so much more than that too. It's connection, it's celebration, um, it can be grief for some people. And so just knowing that like, there are a lot of reasons why we eat and, um, why we enjoy certain foods. Like sometimes you enjoy things because they're nostalgic or because it reminds you of so-and-so and that's good too. Um, and so like seeing food in that way can be helpful also. Yeah, that, that makes me want to ask another question that I know that Chelsea was really interested in. Um, we saw, you said something about um, how early life trauma can cause IBS or be what, maybe not cause, that might not have been the right word, but um, be a really big contributing factor to IBS or um, gut issues. And can you elaborate on how that gut brain nutrition or mm -hmm. gut brain connection, I should more say, um, can influence that? Yeah. So the research is fairly new on this, but it's really interesting. So there's been several studies that have come out that have shown that kids who were exposed to early life trauma, um, are more likely to develop gut issues later on in life. Um, and just showing like the connection between the brain and the gut and how like processing trauma and processing grief can affect the gut. And not to say that like, if you had early life trauma that you will get gut issues, but it does predispose you more to them, or at least that's what the research is showing. Um, and you can also think of it too, like if someone, let's say someone was in foster care or was, you know, bouncing from home to home early in life, like how did their early life nutrition affect their gut as well? And so there's, there's a lot of different factors there and the research is still fairly new, but it's really interesting just showing mm -hmm. that our emotions do affect our gut and it's important to look at everything and it's important to resolve any emotional traumas or work through them so that you can improve gut health and just overall health. 
Absolutely. And, you know, like you said, that kind of goes into how the gut is responsible um, for serotonin and the neurotransmitters and such and mood. And can you just um, also elaborate a little bit on like the chemical things that are happening with that gut brain connection? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the biggest ones is what you mentioned. So serotonin is produced in the gut. Serotonin is our feel good hormone. And oftentimes when people are are struggling with gut issues, they also are struggling with anxiety. And the reason is because their gut is not producing as much serotonin to help them feel happy and, and feel calm. And so there's often this connection of, wow, I, I improved my gut symptoms and I also improved my mood. And then I guess the other part of it too is that your neurotransmitters do affect digestion. So serotonin affects gut motility. So and by motility, I mean movement of stool through your intestines. So when someone doesn't have enough serotonin, they will be more constipated, or if they have too much, they will have diarrhea. So it just shows like the interplay of hormones and how that affects digestion and how you really do kind of have to look at everything because they all do work together. That's crazy with the motility. And I mean, that is like super specific chemical stuff happening in the body. So Mm -hmm. how can antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications affect that? Yeah. So one of the treatments for constipation is actually SSRIs. Um, And that's something that they've used for a long time. Um, I think that I mean, it it really kind of depends on your doctor and it depends who you're seeing, but it is fairly common to see people who struggle with constipation on anxiety medication because of the indirect effect that it has on um, serotonin and mood. Yeah, that's super interesting because um, that's exactly like what I've just experienced. I was on one antidepressant And my GI decided to switch me to a different one um, because she said that that one has gastroenterologists prescribe it for the gut and it can help with your gut symptoms. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's really interesting. And to me, it kind of made sense in the way of like, well, nervous system, gut, okay. But to know those actual chemical things, that's, I mean, that's really cool. Yeah. The body is very fascinating. The body is so fascinating and this whole conversation has been fascinating. Um, it's, it's been great to just like, cause these are all the questions that you also like, you don't get to ask when you're at the doctor's office because either, you know, you, they don't have the time. And, and then additionally to that, it's um, I think that's probably one of the biggest differences perhaps with like functional medicine um, in comparison to like you said, you're looking at the whole thing, you know, when you are talking to maybe just a registered dietitian um, or a gastroenterologist or a primary care, you know, you're still looking at like all these different singular pieces and then you sort of have to figure out how to put it all together. But with a lot of functional medicine and it sounds like with what you practice and um, advise is looking at all aspects. And so um, it definitely sounds like in order to start healing your gut, you do have to look at each little, each little piece. They're all for sure, like really connected. Yeah. And I think just remembering, like, it doesn't have to be extreme and it doesn't have to be this huge life-changing overhaul. I mean, I guess it depends on where you're at, but don't be overwhelmed because that's obviously, as we've talked about, that's obviously going to cause more issues. So just figuring out like, what am I able to do and what is manageable for me right now? What are some small changes that I can make? Maybe that's even like, I'm going to try to include like this many different colors in my diet per week, or just, it could be really simple. It doesn't have to be extreme. Um, and yeah, I, I love the analogy of kind of comparing it to a tree. So if you have a tree and you're watering the roots, everything is going to flourish. But if you're just continuing to cut off branches, obviously that tree is not going to. So you can kind of think of the body in that way. Like how do we water the roots and really create a beautiful blooming tree versus just continuing to cut branches off? Um, that's kind of how I like to think about it. I love That's so that. beautiful. That's, mm-hmm. I agree. 
So you clearly are a wealth of knowledge. Where can people find you if they would like to learn more about you and what you do and just make sure they stay up to date on all the amazing tips that you like to share? Yeah, so um, the, the easiest way to find me is probably on Instagram. That's where I hang out the most and that's at gutbrain.nutrition. Um, you can also find me on my website, which is nourishfunctionalhealth.com. Um, and you know, you can contact me through the contact button on my website. You can join my email list through there as well. And, um, yeah, those are probably the two best places to find me. And we'll put those in the show notes, of course. And so thank you so much for taking this time with us. This was wonderful. So informative. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I love what you guys are doing and, um, it's been great to spend some time with you. Yay. Thank you well, so much. Thank you, Heather. And we will talk to all of you listeners soon. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Please write us a review to help us reach more people like you. If you'd like to connect with Cassie and I, you can find us on Instagram at The Real Spoonies Unite. You can also join our private Facebook community, Spoonies Unite, or you can visit our website, therealspooniesunite.com, for all sorts of resources and to stay up to date with our current projects. And don't worry, you can find all these links in the show notes below. Thank you to our wonderful Spoonie patrons for all your support, and you can become one too. That's right. All you have to do is go on over to patreon.com slash the real Spoonies Unite, and you can get all sorts of extra goodies like videos of our episodes and more. Any support is greatly appreciated. It helps enable us to create more content for all of you, as well as make this podcast sound better and better. Thanks for listening. We can't wait to be back in your ears soon.